Hi, good afternoon. Today we are very, very, very lucky. We have with us Michael Quick. Uh, I don't know if I'm properly Quet. saying your name. Quet, sorry, sorry about that. Um, Michael Quet is uh, a visiting fellow at Yale University. He's an awesome critical uh, scholar. He is digging into the relation, the colonial relations of the digital politics and uh, US digital imperialism. Um, yeah, I don't want to waste this also an opportunity of listening directly to from from him. So the stage is yours, Michael. And again, okay. thank you very much. Okay, thank you, and and I'm uh, excited to be here. Um, so let me then um, start off uh, with what I want to talk about today. The title is about digital sovereignty and. Um, the topics I want to cover are four, and, and we'll see what we could do um, for time. But it's to start off with the degrowth framework, to talk a little bit about digital colonialism. I believe that was covered by some previous speakers, um, so I won't do too much on that. Um, to talk a little bit then about regulation and, and the idea of tech hegemony and, and um, the concepts that are dominant, and then to talk a little bit about solutions uh, for digital uh, sovereignty within a uh, anti-capitalist framework. Um, all right, so um, before I get into the content, I just want to, uh, you know, kind of give a little background about how I wound up in this, and because uh, it, it tells part of the story. So I grew up in the United States, and um, I was in sociology. I started off in anti-war politics and uh, I eventually uh, did a, a women's studies master's and I wanted to do a PhD and I was applying in the United States. This is now around 2012 to, to study digital technology. And within the United States, um, most of the programs were telling me, well, uh, we don't have somebody here who can supervise you. And it's interesting what you want to work on, but unless we have an expert who is in residence to supervise you, you can't do this dissertation here. So I wound up contacting um, Lucien van der Waal in South Africa, who wrote a book about anarchist politics. And uh, he was open-minded to the, even though he's not an expert in, uh, and the others in the department are not experts in, or, or taking on the su subject of digital technology, um, they were open-minded to the idea and, and they took me in. So I wound up in South Africa, um, partially because, you know, having started off in the United States and being close to some family members, I didn't want to go too far away from home. I actually wound up halfway across the world. Um, and the lesson there in part is that there's uh, potentially in, in, in built um, conservative bias in the academic system in which the elder um, professors and managers decide what topics to study and take up. And if they don't take them up in a particular field, then if society is changing quickly, how do younger, the, how does the younger generation then take on, you know, these ideas? Um, so I wound up there, I had to pick a, a subject um, for the study. And I wound up the African National Congress, uh, Mandela's party, um, was there was a, a textbook crisis in the Limpopo province of, of non-delivery textbooks for students. And they were looking to put tablets into schools. So I picked as a topic, well, why not look at this idea of um, tech in schools? And uh, from there, I started to learn about uh, who is going to be the ones behind this, right? And at that point, it was Microsoft is uh, is actually dominant before Google, and that's in part because, um, say, Google Chrome and a lot of Google services are run off the web, and there's not good um, internet connectivity in a lot of the country. So, um, but it was Microsoft, it was Google, it was Pearson. Um, these guys are are very dominant, and then on top of that. Um, uh, so you see uh, that there's an education technology element uh, being driven by big tech and the idea of big data and artificial intelligence, but also there was a doubling up, 
Um, here, this was a great opportunity for Microsoft to, and for Google to, to capture the youth, to capture an emerging market. And from there, I kind of broaden my perspective on, um, you know, this idea of digital colonialism and the dominance of big tech um, in foreign territories. Um, so that's, that's kind of the journey. Um, and um, I want to, we'll return back to some of that, but uh, before going forward, I want to just sharply transition to the, to the context we're, we're living in right now. Um, so I started tuning in uh, more and more into the environment issue uh, a few years ago, um, primarily through Jason Hickel, who is from Swaziland, which is a little landlocked country, uh, you know, right around uh, South Africa. And um, he wrote a book called The Divide, which is a very nice book on why there's global inequality and um, concluded with a, a chapter on, on, on the environment. And then more recently, he's uh, been pushing very hard at the issue of the environment and, and the concept of degrowth. Um, so here's the, here's the general context. And I want to bring this up because I believe that we cannot talk about digital politics and technology outside of the more general framework of the situation that we face. So here we are today, um, just some, some going to throw out a, a portion of, of some of the key facts that we should keep in mind. Um, so 4 billion people live under a meager $7, on a, a meager $7.40 per day uh, globally. Um, there is an emerging consensus that the amount of material resources that we should be consuming is somewhere around 50 billion metric tons total per year. And I go through some of this in an essay um, called, um, um, I forget, oh my God, uh, Digital Tech New Deal. There you go. Um, and it's at SSRM for free. I have a summary piece of Al Jazeera if, if you want some of the more details. But uh, the idea here is that we, um, so the idea of alleviating poverty, the dominant framework has been just to just grow the economies, right? If, if everybody gets a little bit more at the end of the year, then even if the rich are making off like bandits, or even if there's egalitarian growth and everybody equally gets more, um, the idea has still been to grow. And that's been the um, form that we experience capitalism. The framework of capitalism is to accumulate, to grow, to expand, um, and so on. And we're in a situation in which we have um, a, br a breakdown of the environment, both in terms of global warming or heating, and also in terms of biodiversity loss and ecological destruction. And so the premise here of degrowth is that, um, that, that growing the economies are unsustainable on both accounts, and that there's a relationship between the two. The first account is that we're overheating the environment, and as we're trying to transition to clean, green energy, um, if we we're not there yet, so we are not in a situation in which there are solar panels everywhere and uh, wind turbines everywhere. And so as we add more stuff to the pile to produce through the process of growth, as we're trying to draw down the emissions from carbon from dirty energies, we're also piling on more things to produce in during that transition. And the idea is we can't decouple the greenhouse emissions fast enough from the green energy in order to um, stay away from the 1.5 degrees Celsius target that is believed to um, prevent tipping points and uh, environmental disaster. Um, but also there's biodiversity loss. In South Africa, there was an article the other day, um, the African penguin is about to go extinct because um, offshore, um, 0.5% of the territory that's being used for economic extraction by humans is not considered off limits. And if, and they're down to something like 15,000 penguins. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, it, it's um, the, the, we cannot gr keep growing infinitely. And so the idea is that we're actually over the limit. So we're at about a hundred billion um, 
tons of extraction per year aggregately uh, across the world. Now, if we're going to look in a per person um, uh, use, uh, the rich countries, it's about 26 tons per person per year. These are uh, United Nations 2019 Sustainable Development Goal 12 um, numbers. Uh, so from that webpage. Um, so 26 uh, metric tons per person per year. Um, low income countries are about two tons per person per year. It's believed in other literature, I've seen it be about uh, to survive humanly, you need about 1.5 tons per person per year. And uh, the sustainable level is about seven to eight tons per person per year. So really what we should be doing since we have reached the limits of growth is attempting to redistribute wealth and income globally, which means that the middle and upper classes, depending on where we're talking, because middle class is defined differently in different areas, sometimes it's lower than others, but the middle and upper classes, especially in the rich countries, of course, are over consuming. And um, this is the, the crisis. And also, the, um, uh, so again, from the UN, on a per, per, per capita basis, high income, uh, high income countries rely on 9.8 metric tons of primary materials extracted elsewhere in the world. Um, so there's a net transfer of uh, people who are extracting resources. And so the um, issue is uh, on the current trajectory, it would take 200 years to lift everyone to at least five dollars per day and the world economy would grow by 175 times its present size that would destroy earth in, in our environment many times over before we even approach that and if we just had the post-world war ii egalitarian growth that's a popular um um uh longing or or romanticized past in the u.s these days um, we would still destroy the environment. So um, the issue we have here is to try to redistribute wealth and uh, go uh, into a steady state economy that is fair and just for everybody. Um, so when we're thinking about digital technology, we can't really get outside of that uh, framework. Now, to look at the issue of, uh, say, digital colonialism, I don't want to uh, say too much here because I believe it's been covered um, in this conference, but uh, the premise is that there, uh, under classic colonialism, you have an expansion of merchants, you have an expansion of the European powers uh, who uh, venture out into the world. They create forts along the Western coast of Africa. They uh, build seaports railroads, et cetera, and they penetrate into the economies of um, uh, people throughout the world. And they do this through a process of, um, of uh, military domination, economic domination, and a large part of that was the infrastructure. So if you look at the design of railroads, uh, there's a good study, for example, on the railroads in Kenya, and they show that they bypass the local villages. If you look from an aerial uh, viewpoint, um, once they were able to penetrate inside the country, they built the, the railroads to link up um, areas where they're putting people to uh, work on the farms to produce cash crops. Um, they are linking up military outposts and they're designed for the people who built the railroads, not for the people who live there. And for the purpose of exploitation, then they're extracting out raw materials, they're shipping them back to say Britain. And uh, at that point they're mass producing say textiles. And in some cases they will um, ship them back out to the global south areas and undermine any prospects they have of building their own markets as well. Um, so if we're to look at the uh, digital era, um, it's, a, it's a very similar process. Now you have um, transoceanic cables, you have cloud server farms um, being built uh, throughout the south. You have a design of the um, digital economy and the services and platforms um, so that they are 
uh, are designed in a way that reflect the interests of those who own and control and do the designing of the systems. And basically they own all the stuff. Um, so if you were to start going through the uh, industry verticals, if you were to look at the uh, processors in your computer, the operating systems on the desktop and laptop, the um, operating system that's in your smartphone, um, anything, office suites, entertainment with Netflix and Spotify and so on, um, transportation with Uber, Lyft, um, Estonia-based Bolt. Um, if you start looking at most of the core stuff, this is the, the cloud server farms um, with say uh, Amazon and Microsoft, uh, the top two. If you look at all the stuff that basically an individual as a consumer or even a business needs to use to be using computers, the Americans are always getting a cut. Now, of course, the Chinese are in, are in a kind of distant second place and there are some, there's some variation. It's not just the United States, but if you start looking through this, the United States is overwhelmingly dominant. So if you want to talk to your friends, email, social networking, anything you want to do, you want to turn your computer on, um, basically uh, these mega corporations primarily located in the United States are taking a cut of all this. And then you can be a small business and you can build a little, um, you know, you can build tech into your business or you can build your own little tech startup, but you're taking your, your industry or, or I'm sorry, your business is um, operating in the context of um, of operating on top of those who dominate the core stuff. And so it's an extractivist um, um, form of domination. It's an evolution of the colonial disaster that started um, in, over the last, you know, four or 500 years. Um, so uh, one of the things that should stick out to, at, at people is that, if you're looking at the conversation, especially in the United States about digital technology, uh, especially if you're looking at regulation and antitrust, um, you, you wouldn't really get the sense that this is a global phenomenon. It's different, of course, for Europeans and for everybody else in, in the world. Um, but um, in the United States, there's not really much talk about this. And I've been at the Information Society Project at Yale University for now, three years, three, four years formally. And uh, there really just isn't much um, conversation about it. And um, that's a political choice. And um, it's the same thing when w if we're looking right now at um, antitrust and, and we're looking at uh, Congress regulating big tech, it's the same kind of thing. When they're talking about uh, the harms of big tech, they're talking about harms for Americans. Um, the issue with that is the dominance of the big tech corporations outside of US borders is part of what makes them so big, right? So if we're gonna look at say, uh, some of these companies having a market cap exceeding a trillion dollars, uh, some of them are, the more than half of that, of their revenues are coming from outside of the United States. So where does all that money come from, right? And not only that, but even when they're, they're penetrating into a small market, say a place like South Africa or um, comparable countries, um, they, it may be a small part of say Facebook or Google or Apple's uh, revenue, but they're dominating say 80 plus percent of their advertising revenue, Google, Facebook, um, uh, Duopoly, for example. So if for those countries are experiencing it as something which is an overwhelming force. Um, so uh, the, the issue, the issue then comes into, uh, in our current moment, um, questions about, you know, what to do about the power of big tech. And um, one of the things uh, that a resistance movement that occurred uh, as big tech became something that spread, let's say, from a mainframe era into the day-to-day -day lives of people was the free software movement. And the free software movement was really in essence, kind of uh, as a movement, I guess you can say, because um, there was sharing of technology before 
the mid eighties, but Richard Stallman was the, um, you know, kind of central figure to launch the free software movement. And that was a day in which, you know, the internet was still something that, you know, universities used and it wasn't a consumer, you know, product. And the software that you got would be something that you got from a floppy disk or a CD and you brought home and you installed in your computer. And so the control over the user experience was really uh, at that time based on single pieces of software that you used in your inside your computer that you loaded into your computer. So the context is a little different, but the idea here was that with free software, anybody is free to use the program. Anybody is free to modify the program. And then you can share exact copies or modify copies and you were given access to the source code. And in the strongest form of a free software license, a license here should be thought of as, as the power that you get to do something with this software um, was copyleft, which, which basically said that the terms of this license are such that the same freedoms must be granted perpetually for anybody who receives a copy of this software. Um, that was taken up in the global south. Uh, so while the, the, we can look back at the, the free software movement, we could say maybe they didn't pay enough attention to the social and political dimension of the situation and they focused more on rights of the users, um, that um, um, it wasn't seen that way uh, universally as well. Uh, so South Africa, I, I review in, in my dissertation, had a huge uh, policy drive towards adopting a free and open source software policy preference. And that was aimed at Microsoft. And the uh, impetus for them was to stop the monopoly power of the Microsoft juggernaut. So now we're talking the early 2000s. And then everything changed as the internet spread everywhere, big data, AI came along, uh, you know, the growth of platforms and, and so on. And um, free software evolved with that, but it was basically um, written out of the conversation. How is it written out of the conversation? Snowden came along in 2013. Um, that awakened a lot of people to the importance of big tech. So again, if you go back to where I was saying with my dissertation, I have people saying to me, why, Mike, are you going to study technology in sociology? Does that even make sense? Um, and... Um, if we, if we were to travel back to 2010, believe it or not, a lot of intellectuals did not think very much about technology at all. And so um, Snowden's shocked everybody into paying more attention. And then slowly that conversation transitioned over towards the big tech corporations and getting critical about them. And it's not to say that there was, there was no attention at all before, but I'm saying as a, um, as a popular thing for intellectuals to be focusing on. Um, so, um, in, so the free software movement was kind of part of the intellectual conversation and the rights conversation, access to knowledge and software, um, in the, uh, say mid nineties or, or nineties and, in, in, you know, first decade of the two thousands, but then it just kind of got drowned out. And really what wound up coming into the conversation was, um, algorithmic bias, which is great unto itself but can be a very conservative force if it starts and ends with the issue of um, algorithmic bias. And um, now we have this big movement about regulation. And so the issue um, here with regulation is that um, it, I just wanna give a case example here. Um, if we're looking at something like Facebook, um, it's a centralized network. It is a proprietary network. It has network effects, meaning that the more people who are a member of, of the network, the, the better off you are, and they do not interoperate. And so if you look at the, the antitrust literature um, on this, they've kind of ignored um, what's called the Fediverse, which is a, a set of social networks that have uh, Mastodon is the biggest one. It has 4 million, over 4 million registered users. It's uh, a product which is um, used by a lot of people. It's not a theoretical project. Um, I review it in a paper called Social Media Socialism, which is on SSRN. Um, but the, um, the issue is uh, we can look at 
what, you know, the question of Facebook, well, what do we do about Facebook? One of the ideas is force it to interoperate so that people aren't forced to be stuck in Facebook. Because right now, if you want to use, say, a Mastodon, you have to now yourself move over there. Then you have to convince your friends to move over there. So you have them to talk to while you're using Mastodon. But then they have to ask all their friends to, to, to migrate over. And so the non-interoperability, the fact that I cannot talk to somebody else um, without leaving and logging in separately um, in Facebook uh, winds up having this uh, consolidation effect where um, it's impossible to get people to sign up for more than one or two or three social networks, right? Or four, you know, it's never going to be a lot. So um, the, uh, so we can break Facebook up into WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook. The proposal to, to have interoperability has finally entered the conversation after a decade of free software development on this, and it's been ignored by the people who are talking about antitrust. Um, and um, so the um, um, interoperability part, if you look, there's a bill called the Access Act in the United States, and I actually talked off the record to the drafter of the Access Act, and the way it works is there are um, a hundred, if you have a hundred million users, then uh, a smaller, you have to allow smaller networks to interoperate with you, but they're not forced to interoperate with each other. And when you really think about it, this basically means if I'm little book and I want to create an alternative to Facebook, uh, Facebook, it has to allow my users to talk to Facebook, but not if they're small book, which is another one. And so basically this means that if I'm a Facebook user, I can get access to everybody still. So there's still an element in the bill which is preferential to big tech. On top of this, if you start now digging deeper at the antitrust movement, um, everything is based around competition. So the idea is that um, the way to construct the digital economy and make it better is to get rid of the unfair um, non uh, anti-competitive business practices like Facebook not allowing social networks to interoperate um, so that everybody can compete. But they're, what they're doing is they're just unleashing, re-unleashing this competition for growth, right? And so they're doing it either by pumping advertisements at everybody or by um, uh, charging users, which is inequitable if you don't have any disposable income, say, if you're in the global south. On top of that, if there's going to be competition among businesses, um, there uh, uh, is the problem that competition doesn't ver do very much if you're living in a country like, say, South Africa, where 80% of fourth graders can't read for meaning in any language at all. There's no resources. So who gets to benefit once we have a truly quote unquote competitive market when all of this antitrust is done? It's the rich countries who are, you know, want, don't want a Jupiter sized planet killing them, but want to create their own Saturn sized planets that are gonna go and, and, and grow and compete to pump ads to people and or to charge users when users don't have any ability to pay. Now, if you look at a situation like the um, Fediverse, and I'm gonna wrap up here, I got about what, five minutes? Okay, um, so um, if, you, if you look at um, uh, the Fediverse, the Fediverse is based on free software. Uh, they don't serve any advertisements to the users. They decentralize the um, ownership of the uh, servers, and um, and uh, they they construct it in a way that basically socializes uh, the ownership of the networks. Anybody can start up their own little Fediverse social network, and that makes it harder for anybody to impose, say, ads on people. Because why would you join the one that's imposing ads on you when you can join the one? That's, um, that's not doing it. And in addition to that, there are um, options to further decentralize it, the um, hosting of, uh, of the uh, information and, and to encrypt it and, and so on. And uh, you can go through that in, in my uh, paper on, on social media or on a little short article I have in Al Jazeera because I'm going to run out of time here to really unpack that. Um, but I just want to get at this, um, this issue of uh, with the time we have left here, um, of of kind of what to do about 
um, this issue. So instead of talking about the idea of um, socializing the tech ecosystem, which would uh, relinquish the intellectual property. So who owns and controls the software? Who owns and controls the um, data centers? Who owns and controls the hosting of the information and um, you know the networks on, on which we operate? Yes, we do need some regulation, no doubt. Um, so, uh, but if it's a regulation that's geared towards competition and, and, and market competition, um, it's, it's going to reproduce the same kind of outcomes and it's at best, it's just going to make it a little bit nicer. Now, if you look at the, the, there's a green new deal, but there's also a red deal and the principles of the red deal are four, fourfold. What creates a crisis cannot stop it. So here we can't have more digital capitalism and really stop this process from occurring Two, there needs to be change from below and to the left. Three, politicians can't do what mass movements do. And four, from theory to action. So um, there's no, th this antitrust movement is a movement from above. It's, it's by po policymakers and elite intellectuals in the elite university system, um, primarily, right? And um, politicians can't do what mass movements can do. There's no platform here for mass movements of how to reconstruct the tech ecosystem. Now, um, the, to, to put this into the framework, again, of degrowth, um, it, it doesn't, if, we're, if all these tech companies are going to try to do is just grow the economy and accumulate wealth and lock up knowledge in the means of, of, of production, then we're going to wind up right back in the same spot. Um, so um, the only real way to break free of this is to... Um, come up with a, a, a different platform that can appeal to the masses that can then put pressure on these uh, corporations to stop doing their most atrocious things, but also to transform the way we produce technology. And, and here, I just want to note that the ownership, private ownership of technology will always benefit the rich countries. When you have 80% of your population that can't read for meaning they can't be intellectual producers and, com uh, and compete with the, the rich countries at all. It's never going to happen in my lifetime or, or in, in many lifetimes from here. And so they benefit from free and open source knowledge and the transfer of technology um, freely. And so in order to have something like that, we would need to change the way we fund the tech ecosystem, which would mean that we have to put heavy pressure on our, um, um, on our uh, governments to begin to, to draw down, hyper tax the rich and draw down um, their resources and use it to uh, produce um, other um, ways, means of producing the things that we want. And so just two elements here, if we're looking at something like copyrighted knowledge, right? Books, music, movies, all that kind of stuff. If 4 billion people have basically no disposable income, they're being starved of the ability to get access to those resources. We could make that all free, but we still have to find a way to pay the artists to produce that. And we can do that. Um, we can do that by, for example, creating vouchers that are, or and then organize artists into decentralized artist associations, and then people can take their vouchers from tax money and decide where to put that money. So it's not the state who's deciding what art gets funded, right? And then they can have autonomy the way university has autonomy. Um, you can, and we can also do this for the technologies that we have. But if we're going to start looking at that, like at things like getting rid of patents, getting rid of software copyright, we have to have alternatives in place to produce this kind of technology. And so this is, I think one thing that we have to start um, looking into and in terms of creating concrete plans, other things we can do um, is uh, start replacing the big tech out of schools, right? Educating uh, people um, about alternatives. I have a, a guide that I put out uh, in South Africa called People's Tech for People's Power. It goes through, it's, it's designed for securing privacy. It goes through a wide range of everything that we use from 
um, our chat apps to the video conferencing software that we use, everything that we use. And there are in many cases, or in most cases, free software options that are there. Um, so we can start putting that stuff into schools, especially in the global South, where a lot of people will get um, access to technology for the first time as a subsidy from schools, because a lot of families can't afford to buy a little laptop or a little tablet. So the global South countries can subsidize um, free software to their populations. They can start taking seriously and putting free and open source software policy preferences into place in the public sector so that um, they're basically now subsidizing the free and open source technology development. They can pour funds into um, developing free and open source software technology. So I just wanna close out then in, in saying two things here. Um, I tried to throw as much as I could in this small space um, out there, um, but there are concrete solution, solutions that we can work on and build upon um, right now, but we have to put also the issue of the environment and the degrowth context um, into place and, and start thinking about digital con um, uh, capitalism in that context, not separate from it. And so if we're looking at something like, you know, a, a green data center, even if that data center wasn't drawing down energy, even if that data center um, wasn't, um, uh, was made out of, uh, didn't, we didn't have to use materials to build the data center itself. If Google employees, if Microsoft employees are still getting $250,000 a year salary as their median salary, and then they're taking that $250,000 and they're using it to buy material goods that are being produced in an unequal division of labor by the global south because they own the knowledge and the property and the high tech economy and as private property and the south can't compete on that so they're forced to do things like create cash crops and dig in the dirt for minerals then we're going to keep perpetuating this crisis so we have to also be mindful of the of 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 integrating the analysis into the current context and um, I hope that was as, as good as I can do in 35 minutes. That was great. Thank you very much. Um, I have so many questions for you, but we have very little time. So I'm going to focus with the most specific one. Uh, you mentioned the question of interoperability. Um, that raises another problem, uh, data ownership. Okay, who owns the data? So I was wondering your thoughts on data commons, data ownership, data dividend. What, what, what is the alternative to the model we have? Um, yeah. Um, so I'm with Stallman on this. Um, he's been saying for almost a decade, any system that we build has to be um, collect as little data as possible. And, um, you know, the, if we're looking at, we need to disaggregate out and, and really detail out the difference between different systems, because there's a difference between something like Facebook and something like email and something like shopping where data is still collected and so and like Amazon and their platform. Um, so if we're going to stick to say Facebook, um, the ideal solution would be to, the best you can actually do that's I've, and I've talked to some of the developers on this um, is to um, decentralize so that anybody, any service can interoperate and then use a technology like say Libre Social, which reserves a portion of your hard drive. Um, and then that e everybody is run e each person who's on that network is running, is reserving a portion of their hard drive, which is storing data from the network. Um, so the data storage is decentralized all the way down to the edge users, and then it's encrypting it. And then the only people who get access to be able to read a message that's a private message are the ones who have the access privilege, i.e. if you're my friend, then only you can see that data based on the software allowing you to open that unencrypted message. It's kind of like Tor shuttles information around in an encrypted fashion, right? And so, but the, the, the problem with all social media is that if the data is open, as, in other words, if it's a public post, you can't stop somebody from seeing it, one. And any, so you, you would get more privacy in a decentralized system like Libre Social if it's for your private posts. But the flip side is scraping is easier 
in an open decentralized fashion because you can't see all these um, outside parties coming in all over the place and trying to scrape the information one by one by one by one. Whereas if a party comes in and tries to scrape, say, a Facebook or a Twitter, they're a centralized unit so they can see that all this scraping, this attempt to grab all their, their pu public posts are being pulled out. So at that point, I don't have, but the, the flip side of it is Facebook, Twitter, all these guys have, they're the masters, they get all the access to information and then they can divvy that out to police, to law enforcement agencies and so on. So I, I just say on privacy, on something like social networking, there's no perfect solution, but I do believe that any um, uh, service that's built should attempt to collect basically no data if possible. Yes, yeah, there was um, also an answer. I have another question that actually connects with uh, the previous one. Um, okay, imagine that we have this uh, digital inter interoperability in the European Union or in, in the US, but how do you actually enforce that? And how do you make these super powerful corporations to actually let the users take their data and move it into an other Thing because we actually lack of a public, uh, non-exploitative uh, corporations. I think if we don't have public alternatives, non-exploitative, non-extractivist uh, alternatives to that, that will be impossible anyway. So you can't actually enjoy your rights, your digital rights, if you don't have alternatives to actually, uh, they will be just wet paper, like nothing, right? I know what, what your thoughts are on, on this. Well, I mean, look, I brought up, um, it was a little bit rushed, but uh, I do deal with it in, in other writings. Um, the If you're looking at Mastodon in the Fediverse, they open source, free and open source, the platform itself. And by that, I mean the software that's running the um, service that you have. The way Mastodon works in, at present is that um, anybody can, can open up a server and run a server and you can join any server and then those servers interoperate and it seems seamless. So you talk to somebody from another server and it just seems like they're in your feed and whatever. It's kind of like email, right? And, but the thing is the, the server administrator owns the, um, or, or, or runs the, the system. And so they can get access to all of the data, like when you log in and, and, and stuff like that of its users. And that's why Libre Social comes in and kind of breaks that and, and further decentralizes it. But the, what the free software does there, and I, th this is gonna get back to your question with rights. The, the free software does is it allows at least, if you wanna put a malicious feature in a Mastodon, Mastodon just for the, for the um, audience here, just looks kind of like Twitter. You should just go there and try to join Mastodon and see what it's like. Um, but the, if, if somebody tried to like insert malicious ads and things like that, when the software is free and open source, somebody else can take that, that, that server software and then they can implement a, an alternative version that's ad free. So my point is here that um, when you have the right to, to um, there should be a, a concept of a right for people to control their software and their software experiences, which goes to copy left in decentralization of server, the means of computation, storage, processing, hand in hand. So I think there should be a movement to um, um, demand a rights in terms of the control of the technology. And that's, that. I, yeah, I mean, what are we going to do about the corporations? That's why I brought up the Access Act. They're going to try to take these things like interoperability and water them down in ways that are beneficial to themselves. That's what they're going to do. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. We're running out of time. Um, hopefully we'll keep in touch. Um, we hopefully have more events like this and yeah, let's organize, keep in touch, think together, conspire together and try to build a better world, maybe. Absolutely, yes. I, and, I look forward to the next speaker. Uh, yeah, actually um, we'll have the next speaker in about uh, 15 minutes. So hold on there, 15? Yeah. Oh yeah, in five minutes, sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, in five minutes, so hold on and see you soon, bye. Okay, bye-bye.